Okay, so welcome to the House of Chains Goliath rundown for the Barefoot Miniatures channel. Um, you can either see me today with a completely cut out background if everything goes successfully, or you will be seeing me in the corner of the screen with a ridiculous green screen behind me. And that'll just be entirely based off how the post-production goes of this episode. So as I say, we're gonna go over the Goliaths in this episode, and we're gonna go over the general topic of Goliaths, so strengths, weaknesses of the gang overall. We'll then break down the fighters that the gang has, and I will go over the skills, weapons at some point in that, just whenever feels natural to just do that, as well as the Goliath gene crafting that each fighter can take part in. If you just want the gene crafting, which I know will be a big part of this, like why people will listen to it, it's the most complicated part of the Goliaths, there will be chapters down at the bottom that you can just skip to that. So what do I think are the main strengths and weaknesses of the Goliaths? And the main strength of the Goliaths, I think, is their singular purpose. You are really heavily steered towards close combat in this gang. It's the overriding best quality of them is their focus, I, I think, because you're gonna enter every game with your game plan. And other than Corpse Grinders, you are going to be better at close combat than every other gang out there. Just hands down. If you can get, if you can successfully pass your willpower checks, I would say you were probably close enough on par with Corpse Grinders as well. You're not going to get the attacks that they get, but your toughness, your green gene uh, your gene crafting, all of that will put you actually as good, I think, as Corpse Grinders. The negatives against Corpse Grinders are going to come in the extra things that they can do, such as making you just stand there like an idiot and like this some of the cards that they get, things like that but are just on a par, I think Goliaths are as good if you are lucky enough to pass all those willpower checks and things like that. You also have access to ferocity skills on all of your fighters. That's something that Ogrins and Corpse Grinders don't get. Whereas Goliaths, your champion's leader, special stimmer champion, are all gonna have the ferocity access to gain nerves of steel, which is absolutely crucial for the gang. It's Nerves of Steel is one of the only things that I would, re and Spring Up, uh, one of the only things that I would ever say you can explain away spamming. And it's because it's the key to making close combat work in a reliable sense. And it's gonna be one of the things that I recommend doing for Goliaths, because you wanna punch people in the face as much as possible. So the next sort of strength of Goliaths is their really good base stats of the stat line and that's going to be strength toughness and cool and those the, you'll stay in the game for a long time with the cool your strength you'll be punching people really on a three up you'll be punching people to death on and then that will add to the weapons that you're going to take just and make it much more reliable that even your basic ganger with a stub cannon can just pummel the enemy ganger to death. That's combined with your high toughness of four, which is going to mean that your goliaths take much less incoming damage. If you get in, if your basic ganger again is going to be wounded on a five rather than a four when you're punching someone. Against the bolt gun, you'll be wounded on a four rather than a three. Las guns, auto guns are going to wound you on a five. And it's a massive thing about Goliaths. And if you get into the gene tampering, you can get toughness five, which means bolt guns, heavy stubbers are going to be wounding you on a five. Now, with that, what are the downsides of Goliaths? Well, they're more expensive than most other gangs. That profile comes with a an exorbitant cost with it. Um, so you will have less gangers on the table. They might out-activate you, which can be a big thing. I would think one of the biggest things in Necromunda. 
or I know one of the biggest things in Necromunda, I would say. Next, your movement of four. You're a close combat gang that wants to run up to people and bash them in the face, whereas that's not gonna happen as easily because of your movement. And there are things to mitigate that, such as cards, gaining skill increases, or sorry, stat increases in the movement characteristic, and that's one of the things that I'd recommend um, as you level up your gang is putting it in movement all the time. Get your charges longer, get them easier, get you running up the board faster. So movement, massive downside for Goliaths. Uh, cost. Now you've got your, your secondary skills as well. Your intelligence, willpower is not going to be very good. How often that comes into it is debatable. Your, your initiative is average. Your intelligence, willpower, unless you're playing corpse grinders, won't massively come into it, unless you're playing much more of a, not a narrative campaign, but something where there's an incentive to use your intelligence and willpower. Um, I've tried to do it in the Ghastly Prospects campaign, which you can see on the channel, in which you activate terminals or there's gas available, although none of us have actually used gas at all up to now in the campaign. So you can do that. And it's not that much of a downside, I wouldn't say the intelligence and willpower, but it is there, it is worse than other gangs. So would I think of it as a beginner friendly gang? And I would say yes. And that's because my definition, if we can call it a definition as grandiose as that, is that anything with a singular purpose where you know what your game plan is as you go into the game, you don't have to respond as much. You know what you're gonna do with Goliaths, you're gonna hit, run up to them and hit them, and that's gonna be everyone's purpose pretty much in the gang. You'll have a few gangers with stub cannons, I like them, but their bodies really your champion's leader are going to be running up and hitting people. And I think that's a good starting point for a beginner. Is it the easiest gang to win with? I would say it's a really good power level of gang right now. It's really one of the top gangs. Does that mean you can play them without any skill? I wouldn't say so. I wouldn't say that about any gang. So it, that is why I get my definition of what is a good gang or what is a good beginner gang from singular purpose type def like factors. So what are the Goliath stat lines? And we'll get into the leader now. So the Forge Tyrant, 135 credits. So 10 credits more, I believe, than an Orlock road, road boss. Um, you get movement four, which is gonna be standard across all Goliaths. Weapon skill and ballistic skill three, which is good on both of them. Strength, toughness, four, two wounds, initiative, three, so better than average. Three attacks on par with Esher's good close combat champions. Leadership, five, cool, four, really good. Will, eight, average like a juve of other gangs. And intelligence, seven, ganger level of other gangs. So, weapon skill, three, I don't think is that big of a hindrance. Once you get one or two of the weapons that you're going to put on there, a lot of them come with plus one to hit, like chainsword plus one to hit. Not that I would immediately recommend a chainsword, it's just an example. Ballistic skill three plus, on par with Orlok champion or Orlok leaders and champions. Now this is your only access to ballistic skill three in this gang. So it slightly steers the Forge Tyrant into that role of being more shooting. You get your standard leader stat or special rules, tools of the trade, gang leader, gang hierarchy, group activation two. As a standard, you can get skill access, brawn primary, leadership primary, ferocity primary, combat shooting and muscle secondary. Now, brawn, just don't even think about it at all. It's a terrible, terrible skill set, I think. You then get Ferocity Primary, Leadership Primary is the ones that you're going to be choosing from. With having a smaller gang size, it really might be worthwhile going Iron Will on your leader. Because you can always skill up into Ferocity later. Ferocity, I'd say, potentially Nerves of Steel if you're immediately going to go with a close combat leader. I actually like to run my leader with the Stub Gun Plasma Pistol Combi weapon. 
um, just to keep him that bit safer. He can still run up in close combat and blast people in the face, but it allows me to get that iron will on the leader to start. So what would I equip them with? And I know you've just heard what I do with my leader, but... So basic weapons, bolt gun, 55 credits, combat shotgun, 60, shotgun and stub cannon. Now, also I'll, I'll go over the special weapons as well. Bolter, flamer, bolter, grenade launcher, bolter, melter, bolter, plasma, flamer, grenade launcher, melter gun. All of them I would say are really good options. I'd say on the weaker side are the flamer and bolter flamer really. And it's not that I don't think flamers are good, it's just I think there's like a bolter melter on your leader is going to be hitting at two up at close range. I love bolter melters, I think they're really good. Whether I get any more usage out of it than just a standard melter, I don't know, but it's it's always there ready to just fry someone. I think the stub cannon would be a good option if you're doing it. It's strength five, it reloads on a three up, it's only 20 credits. If you're going with dual pistol or pistol close combat weapon, I actually think it's a good backup for your leader to just carry around once you've got a bit more credits. Bolt guns, always really solid. Combat shotguns, auto pinning with the template, which is odd auto pinning because you don't need to roll to hit. I mean, incredibly good and good value for 60 credits. I don't think there's actually a bad option on all of these, even like, I know I just said flame a weaker option for me, but I don't think there's a bad option. Grenade launchers with smoke, a really good shout out because having smoke grenades, you get here and in your grenade section, I think are a really good option for your Goliaths, both champions and leader. And the grenade launcher means that it never runs out. You can control where you're placing that smoke create extra cover to get close to a Vansara or any other shooting gang and I think it's really good to have that board control of basically floating terrain. Pistols, you've got I think the best option, the stub plasma. Now on the combi weapons you're rolling two dice and taking the worst results of the two. When you run out of shots with the plasma pistol you've still got the stub because it's a combi weapon. If you run out with the stub, you plentiful, so you're you're just reloading if you choose to reload, which makes it really, really reliable. And it's actually five points less expensive than a bolt pistol, and plasma on low settings are better than bolt pistols, I would say. It's, at 40 credits, it's an absolute steal. And shooting as a secondary skill for you Shooting is a good enough table to just roll on if you want to go with the shooting champion or shooting leader. It's just a really solid table. Like Ferocity, I'd roll on Ferocity. I have been doing in my current campaign with my Orlocks. And it's it's just worthwhile. It gets you the skills faster. There's nothing that's going to be a, an actual bad option. So both Ferocity and Shooting is really good to roll on randomly. And you can just choose the ferocity ones you want if you want to pay that little premium in credits. Heavy weapons, all, oh, not all really good options. Heavy bolter, heavy stubber, I, I even like heavy stubber. Shout at me online if you disagree with that. Missile launcher, really good. Multi melter, if you can get that suspenser. I, I recommend them all with suspensers. Multi melters are terrifying. Again, this is where I'd put it with your leader, Ballistic Skill 3. Now, the Crumper Rivet Cannon. That I don't think is actually in a good place in the game at the moment. It's on the, the normal temperature. I think it's done in temperature. On the, the low temperature setting, it's worse than a bolt gun. It's not got unwieldy, but it's worse than a bolt gun on the rapid fire setting. And the higher setting is the same stats as a grenade launcher crack grenade really and it's more expensive than both of those for only for the same amount of credits you could get a grenade launcher with frag crack and smoke so i just don't think it's worth taking now close combat weapons 
the the picks here really are not Maul. I'm sorry everyone that wants me to say Maul. Not that many out there, I don't think. Chain Axe, because it's just got those extra little special rules over the Chainsword. Power Axe, really good. I really like them. It's not got the two damage, but Renderizer, especially Master Crafted, can be really good if you want to get your leader in combat. Master Crafted Spud Jacker for a really cheap option that gives you knockback if you want to do that. It's, the other ones are sort of skippable and definitely skip the two-handed axe and hammer because they give minus one to hit and that's just terrible for what is actually a premium cost weapon. On to grenades. Blasting charges are really solid. They're not quite all lock demo charges, but they're really good. You strength four, so you're going to be throwing it that bit further than everyone else. It's scary at strength five, damage two, minus two AP, really good. Frag grenade, you'll throw 12, really good. Smoke, if you're not getting a grenade launcher in your gang with smoke grenades, I would say you 100% need smoke on it. Probably two. I'm. I, when I start pinching points, it goes down to one, but two plus people in your initial gang even is a really good place to be. Furnace plates on the armor types, definitely recommend furnace plates. It's five credits. I'd recommend it on every single person in your gang for five credits. A third of the time from the front, it means your fighter's not taking damage, and that's just really good if you think about the overall cost of the fighter including weapons you can then go armored undersuit with furnace plates it's only 30 credits for a four up save to the front which is just incredible on a leader again i tend to skimp on armor if i'm going ranged uh load out with my guys or girls um but if you're going close combat i definitely go armor stim slugs also combat an absolute necessity and not even for the strength or toughness, it's that two extra move for that turn that just lets you get the, on Goliath's seven to nine inch threat range rather than five to eight, five to seven. And it's just such a massive difference in the game that I think you really need it. So then finally, as I said, suspensor, you need it if you're like, if you've got a heavy weapon photo goggles i wouldn't start with them but since you're getting i'm recommending smokes it's worth a shout out that photo goggles are really good even if you're on a combat person because it means you can smoke and then run into the smoke and hit someone with your renderizer so what would i think of as the best loadouts for a goliath forge tyrant chain axe stub plasma double stub plasma I, I've been steering away from the Bolter Melter on my leader because it always puts me in a bad position when you just fry someone. But Bolter Melter is, is solid. If you resist the temptation, which I just never do, I never resist that temptation. But if you can resist the temptation to put yourself in a bad position for a turn and fry someone, I would recommend that because it's hitting better than anywhere else in your gang here. And it also allows, it doesn't have the added expense of the suspensor web. Because the multi-melter I really like, but it's got, it ends up at 240 credits to make it a credible option. Bolt guns are solid. Honestly, there's not that much wrong you could do on this list. Basic weapons, anything but the shotgun. And I even like the shotgun with the extra ammo types. It's just not that special on your leader if you don't have those ammo types. Pistols, definitely the stub plasma but pretty much any of those there are great. The hand flamers may be a bit wasted because of your already high ballistic skill. I know I'm struggling not to recommend anything here, that basically that's why, I'm, that's why I'm going through the list again. Everything is brilliant. Close combat weapons, and except for the Crumper Stub Cannon. Close combat weapons, I like the Chain Axe, Power Axe, render, Mastercrafted Renderizer, Cheap Option, Mastercrafted Stub Jacker, Spud Jacker, and they're all good. And I would definitely start loadout Nerves of Steel or Iron Will on that leader. So next onto the Forge boss. Here you've got basically 
not basically the same stats. You've got similar stats to your leader, your movement 4, weapon skill 3, ballistic skill 4, which is the first big change of the forge boss. Strength toughness 4, 2 wounds, initiative 4, 2 attacks, leadership 6, cool 5, which is excellent, willpower 8, intelligence 8, which is not good, juve stats. You've got group activation 1, all the usual things for a champion or a standard type champion. Brawn primary, ferocity primary, combat, leadership, shooting, muscle, secondary. Now, are we upset about any of those being secondary? No, because you've got ferocity primary. And nerves of steel, 100%. I would say you want your champions in combat, not with ranged weapons. Save the ranged weapon for your leader if you want to go that way. Your weapon skill three, and you, you basically extra disposability over your leader. Your leader is going to be less disposable than the champions. So, Slim, Stim Slug Stash here is less risky than on your leader. So, and whenever you run into combat, it's just risky because the enemy gang could just turn around and just nuke you after that one turn of combat. So, Having it on a champion as the dedicated combat specialist, I think, is the smart play. So, weapon skill 3 ties really nicely with that. Stim Slug Stash for that extra movement, as I said, on the leader. And you've got largely the same loadout as the leader on your weapons. You've got Bolt Gun, Combat Shotgun, Stub Cannon. You've not got the special shells on your shotgun, so skip that one, obviously. You've got the same stub gun plasma pistol in the pistols options. You could even do a hand flamer here because you've not got the best ballistic skill, but it might still be better safe, saved for other places. Um, definitely, if you go in with no other pistol, go with stub gun. And if you can afford it, dum dums. I think because of knocking people down when you're just that too far away to charge you've still got something to do and you want everyone to be doing something every turn, even if it's just denying your opponent action economy. So, special weapons, again, pretty similar to the leader, Bolter Flamer, Grenade Launcher, Bolter Melter, Bolter Plasma, Flamer, grenade, Normal Grenade Launcher and Melter Gun. I lean towards the Melters on Champs, but it's only because I tend to get fried the second turn. As I said, the two up to hit and a two up to wound on the Melter on your leader makes it more attractive there in this particular gang. Grenade Launcher, especially with Smoke, can be good on these champions, mainly because it mitigates your bad ballistic skill here. I wouldn't put heavy weapons here for the because of the high investment on the bad ballistic skill or average ballistic skill but here is where I definitely get at least one render item it can be master crafted for 10 credits I definitely recommend it you've got the two attacks three on the charge there's just too many things that could go wrong in that critical time to not for 10 credits for you on your expensive champion put a renderizer here again grenades put a smoke grenade on someone if you've got a renderizer, maybe put it here because it can be done that turn before you charge when you really need to just run out in the open to be in a good position, like our board position, and you still have the cover with the smoke grenade. Furnace plates, five creds, definitely recommended again. Armored undersuit. If you've gone shooting on your leader and you've got the credits, armored undersuit here on a furnace plate champion is really good. Stim slug stash, 100% necessary if you're going combat um and that's it really I, I recommend pretty much the same loadout as the leader minus the shooting weapons unless it's a grenade launcher again i like the power axe chain axe renderizer options spud jacker is just a bit of a cheap option you could even do a chain axe and mastercrafted stub jacker and it's that bit scarier than a chain axe but these are just gonna do work. They're really good. They're gonna be strength six base with the stim slug stash when you charge. Toughness six. If you've not even done dermal hardening, which we'll get to. And they're just really solid. 
nice position for the champions to be in, I think, with the Stim Slug Stash access. So then onto the Stimmer, the special champion of Goliath for 125 creds. So it's only 25 creds more than the previous champion. You've got movement four, weapon skill two plus, with which is a bit egregious because it's two plus. Maybe you don't even need that. You've got strength, toughness four, two wounds, initiative three, which is solid. Three attacks, leadership eight, cool four, will seven, initiative, intelligence eight. Now, you don't actually get to activate a second champion. And these, these aren't your leader champions or gang hierarchy. They are gang hierarchy champions. They're not your champions that are going to be activating, group activating. They are a soloist and they do it really, really scarily and well. The only thing that really comes near to them is an Esher Death Maiden. So whenever the fight is activated, it may choose to use combat chems until the end phase of the round. The fight gains an additional D3 attacks. However, if it's a natural one, you suffer a bad reaction and your attacks are reduced to one until the end phase. So potentially you're getting between four and six attacks on a turn, like just base. Every time you're in close combat, you want to do this. You really do. You've got ferocity and muscle access as primary. Nerves of steel, 100% necessary. Do not even consider anything else on this champion. With the other two, you could maybe consider some different options. Forge boss in combat, you need that nerves of steel. But here, don't even think about anything else until you've got nerves of steel. So you've got access to stub dum-dums, assault grenade launchers with frag and can buy crack and smoke. Uh, you've got a fighting knife, pulverizer, serrated axe or paired pulverizers and both of those can be mastercrafted. You can get a renderizer mastercrafted, spud jacker mastercrafted, paired stub jackers mastercrafted and you're going to want to go really with either the paired or I, I think you want to go here paired options of paired pulverizers um, just to maximize those attacks on the charge you're doubling your number of attacks and it's it just ensures that you definitely get through everything early in the campaign it can be argued i think that renderizers could be best here but let's just flip to the let's do a direct comparison so you've got paired pulverizers Plus one strength, minus one AP, one damage, and it can be mastercrafted. Renderizers, you've got plus two strength, minus one AP, two damage. Now, doubling your number of attacks on the charge, you're going to re more reliably, it comes to a similar numbers, I suppose. <laughs> you, it, it does come to similar numbers. There's just something that feels better about more attacks. You've actually got more chance to get through the AP. Because if you stim slug stash in, you strength six. You're going to be wounding most people on twos anyway or threes. It doesn't really matter about the plus two strength on, a, on the renderizer once you've stim slugged. So it's just that bit extra. It's win more for the renderizer. Whereas you getting more attacks to the level where your enemy needs to take armor saves if you take the pulverizer, which then ends up in more wounds going through, I would say, in my experience. Now, would I mastercraft him? Less likely here than a renderizer normal champion because you're going to get so many attacks just base by activating your combat uh, chems it's less necessary because you're already rolling more dice. More dice is better than one dice being re-rolled. So, yes, I would do it, but as soon as I start pinching for creds, I would change it out. Assault Grenade Launcher. Now, the Assault Grenade Launcher has um, frag grenades, crack grenades, stun grenades, smoke. Would I use it here? It's got rapid fire, it's really scary. I personally don't think it's the greatest of options. It's, if you want something really scary at range, 
use, I would say, a multi-melter on your leader. It's, it's a good option, but if you're taking a stimmer and you're not taking like three stimmers, I would think you want this guy to be the scariest close combat monster around. And that is done by taking the close combat options, not by your assault grenade launchers. You're paying for that chem stash anyway. So utilize it. If you want to play with it, it's unstable. Your guy could go out of action. I think it's good. I think the rules were actually cleared up how you do the rapid fire blast in the latest FAQ. If not, I've just dreamt it. My favor is going with the paired um, pulverizers. Paired spud jackers are funny, but I'd invest that little, I'd invest that extra into the paired pulverizers on this champion. Because this is, when you start getting to the levels of like the real top dogs in combat, I think you just need to really buckle down and just take the meanest, the meanest ganger around bar none. And that is gonna be these guys. So after Nerves of Steel primary, Muscle primary, do I think it's worth it? ever because you've now got at primary access that's why i'm going over here i think potentially so rah, pairs really well with charging because you charge as your double action and then the good thing about it is you can then move away get into cover and then go down behind that cover to save yourself from what is going to be a lot of incoming fire so yeah, I, I think that is actually a really good use of the ah skill. And I'm actually just trying to get more and more ah into it as we go along. And as well in there, I think there are some good skills. Let's actually go over that skill list now. It just, as I said at the start, it feels like the right time to go over it as you've got primary access to it here. So if we can ever find it. Here we go. You've got Fist of Steel, two higher strength and two higher two damage to your unarmed attacks. Skip. It's got no mind. It's got no AP. I don't think it's worth putting on. It's not worth a skill on that champion and keeping them. If you're going shooting, roll randomly on shooting. If you're going combat, don't do it with your fists. Iron Man, toughness is not reduced by flesh wounds. However, the fighter suffers the number of flesh wounds equal to toughness, go out of action. I think that's quite, I think that's good. I do. It keeps your fighter hard to kill, especially if you've got stuff in the vat uh, grown section of dermal hardening, you're going to be toughness five and that's never going to get reduced. Immovable stance, tank double action, increase save by two to a maximum of two and can't ever be moved. Complete skip. It might be good in some instances but it's not worth a skill it should just be like maybe a, just a, a normal goliath action that any of them can do at, at any time Rah! for the third action as i've just gone over in the stimmer section i think it's good after the charge for getting behind cover and then reducing your incoming damage i think it's good for getting up the board although you sacrificing a, an action next turn you can just keep doing it and it gets you into that, it gets you that pinned action as if you're taking cover and actually benefits you in that shooting gangs can't fire at you if you're behind cover and pinned. It, so it doesn't cost you half your move to do a take cover action effectively. Unleash the beast, you get the flex action. And if you pass a strength check, all enemies push D3 away. Again, maybe cham all champions should just have this as Goliaths but he's not good enough for a skill. And walk it off. If you perform two or more move actions during your activation, make a toughness check. If passed, you can recover one lost wound or discard a single flash wound. Now that's really, really good. He's gonna protect your fighters from getting their wounds pinged off or you, um, your champion from getting wounds pinged off, your leader, your stimmer. Would I take it first? No, I'd always take Nerves of Steel before any of these. Nah, could come second. Walk it off an Iron Man, also potentially second. There's no real best choice from them three. 
they're all really good. It's just what do you want to do with your fighter? And what play style do you want? Iron Man is always going to come into it so long as you get, don't get one-shotted. Walk it off so long as you don't get one-shotted. Nah, can prevent you from getting one-shotted. So I'd potentially do that, but True Grit is still really good. Walk It Off, I would say, is better than True Grit. Um, but from the Ferocity table, but none of them are bad options, and none of Ferocity's bad options. I just wouldn't roll on muscle. I'd only do it on the stimmers. So then, Goliath Forgeborn for the prospects. Then Movement 5, Weapon Skill 4, Ballistic Skill 5, Strength 3, Toughness 4, one, one Wound, One Initiative, Oh, one initiative, one attack, initiative four, leadership nine, cool seven, will nine, intelligence nine. Now, not the best stats ever. Are these guys as good as Orlock Wreckers? No. Do I like them? Yes, I think they're really good models. I think they get a bit expensive. 35 creds for basically a juve stat line just is that bit expensive the toughness four is nice though over other juves and it shows that they're goliaths you get agility secondary combat primary shooting secondary now combat isn't a terrible terrible skill tree having agility secondary is quite good because you could actually roll and randomly get the um, the spring up skill which is in my opinion, the best skill in the game because it lets you get pinned, spring up. No, your chance isn't the best at initiative four, but still, you've not got access to ferocity, maybe ro keep rolling on agility until you get it. And it's just a fun little alternative thing to do in your Goliath gang. So pistol, you get dum dum rounds, storm welders, heavy rock saws. You get grenades on these guys, but do not take them, I wouldn't say because you don't have the strength of the rest of your gang to throw those grenades far, so it's just not worth it here compared to even on your gangers. Furnace plates, five preds, I would definitely take. Undersuit, too expensive on what this fighter is and what it will be doing. So, here is the problem of Forgeborn that everyone says, and, and I agree with, I just like taking them. Stormwell does 75 credits as your main ranged weapon and Heavy Rock Saws 120 credits as your main combat weapon. Now, the Storm Welder, you've got a terrible ballistic skill, so it's just not really worth it, and it's unstable. You're not really going, you're gonna hurt yourself as much as you are the enemy. It's just not a brilliant option. It's not where you want to be putting your, um, your ranged weapons, and it's a definitely a skippable option except for the fluff, or except for the, yeah, the fluff, best way of putting it if you want to do it for the cool bit in your gang. Heavy rock saws, because stub gun and fighting knife, take a dew, don't take these. Heavy rock saw, I actually quite like as an option, and it's not because it makes the best fighter in the world. You've not got access to nerves of steel. You're relying on ro randomly rolling the spring up to get you to be able to stay stood up. But what is cooler than a mental ganger with a heavy rock saw. And I actually run my forge barn with a rock saw. It becomes strength six, so the the strength three doesn't actually matter that much. It also gives you plus one to hit, so its weapon skill goes to three. So a reliable amount of your attacks are hitting. It wounds on a two. It's just really nice to use, it's really scary. People probably target that it's, it's <laughs> messes with people's target priority more than it probably should do, just because you've got this ganger modeled with a massive rock saw. And yeah, do I think it's the greatest option in the world? No. Do I take one all the time? Yes. Yes, I do. With a rock saw. So on to Goliaths, or the Bruiser, which is your ganger type. 55 creds each. So more, as I said before, than other ganger types. You're going to get movement four, weapon skill four, ballistic skill four is his standard. Strength, toughness four, so you're a space marine as per in Goliath gang. Wounds one, 
Initiative 4, 1 attack, Leadership 8, Cool 5, which is incredibly good, Will 9, Intelligence 8. You can have one as a specialist, the Yaganga type, blah, blah, blah. You got on your specialist, Brawn primary, Ferocity primary, Shooting secondary, and Combat secondary. So on your specialist, you can actually be getting Nerves of Steel when you skill up which puts them able really to be a mini champion in how well they can do in combat because they can stay stood up. Do I think it's the easiest way to get there? No, because you've got to actually get that skill up to do it. Is it probably worth just putting something else on them and rolling on shooting? Most likely. But I think you've got a solid stat line on all the gangers. It makes them really scary. You can punch people to death. And it's a really good ganger. So the weapons choices. Bolt gun, combat shotgun, stub cannon are the best options here, I think. Shotgun. I never find myself using them on Goliaths. And it's not just because I've not got the model. That was a conscious choice because I don't think they're the best option. Bolt guns are super scary on anyone. And you get it for the same price as all ox. So Goliath, bolt gun spam could be just as terrifying as people are as Orlocks. Combat Shotgun with Salvo and Shredder. It mitigates your average ballistic skill. You can pin people, which makes them easier to charge. It means they can only stand up and shoot rather than stand up, or they can, means they can only stand up and shoot or stand up and move away. They can't move away and shoot. I mostly like the stub cannon option here. It makes you only 75 creds, 80 with furnace plate, which again, I would recommend every ganger five creds for furnace plate it keeps you cheap it's strength five three up to reload it has no negatives at long range i think it's a really solid option combat i tend to skip or combat weapons i tend to skip on goliath here i don't think you massively need the stub gun backup pistol because your stub cannon is so reliable to reload if you go in a bolt gun i put it in there just because bolt guns don't reload that reliably but stub cannons i've never been let down by really except for by my own rubbish dice rolling combat weapons as i said potentially if you've skilled up to your uh, ganger specialist in ferocity with uh, nerves of steel but not the best you can get stim slugs which makes the ganger specialist combat option more attractive but not still not the most attractive thing in the world but you always want that specialist just to basically just because they can skill up and it's much better than rolling randomly now here's where i did diverge from most gangs i like grenades on goliath gangers because even though it's quite an investment over even just having a normal gun you can chuck normal grenades 12 you can chuck your smoke 12 which is really good you can have your back line chucking smoke and just before your champions have double moved and they outstrip your gangers on the double move the smoke comes down and next turn you're ready to charge and i think it's a really good tactic i've recommended taking smoke on all the champions as well and i stick by that if, if you went in the later stages of a campaign for goliaths having every single fighter with smoke i wouldn't say is overkill it's utility because it can be anywhere that you need it and if you run out on one person you've always got another and i think it is actually that necessary on goliath gangs so on to the final entry of the main house you get the goliath bully the juve 35 credits and i actually really think it's worth 35 credits here Movement 4, Weapon Skill 4+, plus, Ballistic Skill 5+, plus, Strength Toughness 4, 1 Wound, Initiative 4, 1 Attack, Leadership 9, Cool 7, Will Intelligence 9. Not the best mental stats, really good main stats. Weapon Skill 4 is the same as a Ganger. You've got access to Agility, Secondary, Brawn, Secondary, Ferocity, Primary. So your Nerves of Steel comes in here. And it means that your Juves are going to be as reliably good in combat once you've got that as anyone else in your gang really and they can skill up faster 
because when you get the first weapon skill increase or a movement increase or anything to get that second isn't costing you more uh, XP so I really really think with that strength toughness 4 it is worth taking these juves you've got stub with dum dum axe brute cleaver cleaver fighting knife maul spud jacker i like the brute cleaver here it's a bit expensive for a juve kind of but you get plus one to hit so a really attractive option when it comes down to the ganger types which are hitting on fours rather than threes of the champions spud jackers are really cool Spud Jackers give you knockback. Spud Jackers are good. Now, again, I'd put furnace plates on them. They can take stim slug stashes. I'd potentially wait until you have got that nerves of steel to invest them credits in the stim slug stash. Or you could even take it and just surprise someone with the stim slug stash when they've not prioritized the juve as a threat. But you still gain smoke grenades in the war gear and you've still got strength four so still worth taking because even if it scatters it's only scattering d6 and the template's five so you have a couple of jews with smoke and they are laying down that fog of war which you really want as goliaths so that is the main entries we'll go on to the sump croc exotic beast so the sump croc is 130 credits Movement 4, Goliath Standard, Weapon Skill 3, Strength Toughness 4, 2 Wounds, Initiative 6, 2 Attacks, Leadership 8, Cool 6, Will 7, Intelligence 11. Counter Charge. If the owner is charged, this Sump Croc can make a charge double action if it's standing and active. It may immediately make that charge. It strikes before the enemy fighter strikes. Uh, so, it gives your leader, especially, that bit of protection when they have got too close to the enemy, when a death maiden jumps you. Anything that gives you out of action or out of sequence activations is excellent. It's a, it seems a bit on the expensive side. Pets tend to be, but... I've really been enjoying using my Cyber Mastiff, which I also, as Orlox, which I also think is overpriced, but he's done me well. Fluffy, my Sump Croc in my Goliath Gang, is solid. It's as scary as any. It's scarier than a normal Ganger because it's got that weapon skill three, and it's still strength four, which is wounding on threes. It's really good. You're going to be getting three attacks on that counter charge, so it. It's just a bit terrifying. It's got a 5-up save because of its scaly skin. And that's all round. So it's basically got for, like it's basically got mesh armour. You've got brawn primary, ferocity secondary. So you're not staying standing and active if you get shot at. If they shoot at your sump croc, they're not firing at your stimmer, at your forge boss, at your forge tyrant. And then they're in trouble because they've not done that. So it's... I think it's worth taking, even if not to start, it's worth it as an option, I think, for that counter charge. Because when you do come up against other combat specialists, an out of sequence activation is amazing. On to the... Come on. On to the Brute, the Goliath Zerker for 210 credits. It's movement 4, weapon skill 3, strength 6, toughness 5, 3 wounds, initiative 5, 3 attacks, leadership 7, cool 6, will 8, intelligence 10. And I'm not even massively going to go through this. The skill access is where this is really let down. Brawn primary, combat secondary, ferocity secondary, muscle primary. So you're rolling randomly to get Nerves of Steel with what is an entirely combat-focused brute. Your stimmer, even if you get that randomly, your stimmer is as good in combat as, as the Zerka. It's got the same combat chem stash on your stimmer. Strength 6 hardly matters. It's, it's movement 4, same as a stimmer. 
stim slugs to start. So you're going to have to buy all these to start. It's, it's just not worth it. It just really isn't. It pales in insignificance next to the stimmer, which is just so good for the gang. Which is a real shame because having a Mr. Hyde Goliath that has just gone crazy, bulked up, hit the gym too much, and it's it's just it's just not there. It's not where it needs to be. Hangers on, you've got the brute handler, fifty five credits. Slightly laughable after I've just been through that. That one's terrible, but you can do. 55 credits to the Goliaths, 110 for everyone else. Do training on a Brute. If you fail a willpower check, if the Brute fails a willpower check at the end of the game, gains D3 experience. If passed, it's too willful and it doesn't work. You're rolling randomly on Ferocity for your Zerka. It's not good. Ambots are a better option. I think... Eee. Ambots are a better option with Ferocity Primary. Servitor, Ogrins, Frosty Secondary have the same problem. Mutated Ogrins can come with Nerves of Steel. It's, made, it's probably not the best. It's, it's not the greatest use of 55 credits. Now a Chem Dealer, 25 credits, not to one. You get a steady supply of all Chems as common. Also allows the gang to buy a single dose of any Chem or anything containing chems such as stim slug stash medically kits without expending any credits however during the post battle action you must pay for these items afterwards so it's basically getting stim slug stash chems in lieu you could get friends on friends on collar because the friends on collar contains friends on in lieu have more chance of winning that game and therefore getting more credits and paying that back it is an excellent choice for Goliaths, and I think for any gang at 50 credits, for any gang. It get, has the fixer skill, so it's gonna start paying for itself straight away after that first game, in the Ghastly Prospects campaign after that cycle. It's a really solid option. It, it really is. So I would definitely recommend taking it to every Goliath gang, and any gang that wants anyone in combat ever for the Stim Slug Stash access, for the Friends on Color access, for Friends on, but Friends on Color is better. So yeah, really, really good. So finally, the moment we have all been waiting for, and I've been dreading in case I mess it up, because we're to Goliath Gene Smithing. Need to start out to wrap your head around this by choosing Naturally Born, Vat Born, or Unborn. The majority of Goliaths are Vatborn, and if you want an easy way to set up your gang, because you have to do this, you take Vatborn for plus zero credits and don't change a thing. So it's worth saying, I actually quite often just do that. I'm writing a list. I want to just play some casual Necromunda. Goliaths, I think, are fine without any of this. It's they are in the mix without any of these gene smithing upgrades so at creation if you want to go more into it or at t level of buying your fighter you can go into the gene smithing so that barn is no additional upgrades you have nat barn fighters for 20 credits now nat barn fighters are those that are born within the house goliath by house goliath parents and they're one of the few fighters or the few people in there that are naturally born and they have extended lives and that gives them a bit more fear that those extended lives are going to be taken away so they have intelligence increased by two willpower increased by one and decreased cool by one so on the face of it I don't think that is a brilliant trade-off. The cool by what cool comes into the game so often and it's such a big positive for Goliaths. For 20 credits, it, I don't think it's worth just with that taking that as an option. Natborn fighters for plus 10 credits. So you 
Unborn Fighters, plus 10 credits. Unborn Fighters can choose an additional primary skill in Agility, Brawn, Combat, Cunning, Ferocity, so Shooting or Savant. However, you may never select skills from the Muscle group. When added to the gang, can choose from any Gene Smithing upgrades below, blah, blah, blah. As per. Is that a good option? That is an excellent option. If you want a shooting champion, choose it as primary. If you want an infiltrating champion, choose that, choose a, a cunning as primary. It makes it such an option. Like you can, when I've said prospects can't take ferocity as primary, and that, an unborn prospect, if all you do is upgrade it with 10 credits with Ferocity Primary, is worth it. So we, this section sort of flips on the head what I've said previously, and it's going to throughout all of this. A prospect with Ferocity Primary, um, even Savant Primary on Juves once they start getting it, giving them Fixer if you really go in for power gaming. Agility on your, you could even go agility on your stimmer, which is initiative three, and give it spring up, which is just an incredible, incredible build. Forgeborn are initiative four, so worse than that, would I give them make? I don't know, but choosing a primary skill set that you don't previously have access to is incredible and worth 10 credits so i would i think that is worth it if we're just taking that at face value and that is the three types unborn inducted inducted into the house nat born born by doing the hanky panky and vat born the standard normal natural goliath way so Vatborn Fighters, the gene smithing upgrades, and this is the real meat of the gene smithing section, is the Vatborn Fighters with gene smithed upgrades. Your gangers, prospects, things like that, so you basic, what's going to be padding out your gang can only have one of these upgrades um, of the gene smithing. Leaders and champions can have two. So take that when, I've only actually recommended two at a time, but take that when you're going forwards and looking at this of what you actually want to be putting on your champions the real wacky things are movement and toughness and primary skill sets and i'll just let you make the decisions on that yourself so the they start off on a on a low note apparently reduced bone density minus 10 credits from your fighters cost so your fighters are actually now getting cheaper reduce either the Fighters start starting strength or starting toughness by one. A ganger with um what's it called? A ganger with the stub cannon, minus one strength for minus ten points. So you now 35 points for that is gonna be that's where this becomes good. Yeah. Oh for, 45 points. You still toughness four. I never find myself going for it. I don't like the idea of minusing stuff off people just because it's like, oh, well, I want that strength. But this is where like broken Goliath builds can come in is because you can min-max these gangs to all hell. So next, Corrupted Slug, five credits. Reduce these fighters, leadership, willpower, and intelligence by one. That is worth doing again i don't tend to do it that much you're only saving yourself five credits but leadership willpower and intelligence especially on normal gangers are dump stats entirely so it's it, you will not miss not having them on your gangers and it's making you closer to the cost of another ganger it, it's basically the choice between if you've got no more credits do you give them corrupted slug and furnace plates and i think you do Fearless but foolish, five credits extra, increase the cool by one, but intelligence by one. 
but decrease intelligence by one. So you can even corrupted slug and furthest but foolish to get really hardcore extra cool gangers with plus one cool, minus two intelligence or minus one willpower, minus one intelligence. And it's the, it's the net overall no adjustment in cost. Genetic Ancient, plus 10 credits. Um, sharpened Mind, increasing leadership, willpower, and intelligence by one. Now, I think it's, it would be good in some campaigns. If you've got a corpse grinder knocking about, it's going to be good on your champions because you need that, that willpower. Is it worth 10 credits? Definitely not on your on your basic fighters, because you just never really need those, what I'm going to term as dump stats. Hardened immune system, hits from gas weapons, need a six, or toxin, need a six when rolling against their toughness. Five credits. Really, really worth it. And the trouble is here, loads of them are really worth it, because you're going to want to do them all. So, if you've got Escher, Delac knocking about, Ash Waste Nomads with their toxin stuff now, it's worth it because they need a six to wound you. And I know you've already got high toughness, but they can mess with that by getting chem synth and things. Whereas only ever affecting you on a six can't be messed with because it's only ever on a six. Hyper healing, 15 credits. Roll an extra injury dice when making a recovery test and choose to discard which one you wish. So it's knock off true grit in that way. In addition to the post battle sequence, if you have any lasting injuries, roll a dice on a six, you can heal one of them. And that's ongoing. So it's, if you can pinch the credits at creation, it's worth doing on some people. I obviously don't know which ones are gonna get lasting injuries, potentially your champions, because they're gonna be running in there in combat. But it's worth it because lasting injuries, as you can see in the Ghastly Prospects campaign, can really cripple some fighters, especially if you get minuses to toughness. Nerve Burnout, minus five credits. Reduce the fighter's cool by one. Now this is one of the ones that I'd never recommend going for because minus one cool, cool comes into the game all the time and your special thing is minus one cool. Oh, so he's, he's better cool than everyone else. So I'd never take for five credits reducing your cool. Dermal hardening, this is the one that I've referenced in the main section of the, of the uh, list review, or the gang review. Plus one toughness, plus 10 credits. <sighs> toughness five stimmers, toughness five forge bosses, toughness five tyrant, toughness five anything and it's really really good try not to spam these try not to spam these because this is where you will lose friends with dermal hardening because it is just so incredibly good bolt guns wounding you on fives web <laughs> web guns the greatest thing in the game wound you on fours which is a massive step down i can't can't go any further than that but that's a massive step down Strength six grenades wound you on threes. Heavy bolters wound you on fours. It's just such a good upgrade. And it's worth it on everyone if you want to lose friends. Like you've got to sort of, do you want to do it? Do you not? Is you, you pick because it's just the best one. Terminal biology. The years are catching up with the fighter and their body begins to fail the minus 10 credits. Each time you suffer a lasting injury, roll the d6 on a roll of one, the fighter dies and is removed from the gang roster. <laughs> Definitely worth it on your gangers, I would say, because it's just, it makes them much more expendable, especially if you're running with the corpse guild bonds where you get money back whenever you what you delete a fighter from your card. It's it's worth it if you don't if you trust yourself not to roll ones, that's what I'll say. Overdeveloped musculature, plus five credits. 
Increase the fighter's strength by one, but reduce initiative by one. Your strength is already really high. Against toughness three opponent, against anyone but other Goliaths, you're wounding everyone on a three with your fist, regardless of whether you have strength five or four. So I don't actually think it's that worth doing this. If you somehow work out a combination with close combat weapons, because it will be in there to get yourself to strength six, which off the top of my head, a power axe, it's worth it for five credits. If you never fall off gaps. So it's odd depending on your, if it's good, depending on your gaming group's terrain and stuff like that. It's, it's good situationally with your choice of weapons as well as what terrain you'll be playing on. Next, the Natborn Fighters Gene Smithing upgrades. You've got, remember I've said you, your actual, and I've, all of those Vatborn stuff, excellent, absolutely excellent. Natborn, as a base thing I've said, isn't worth it. Your Gene Smith upgrades, Adaptive Biology, Plus 10 credits may reroll any strength or toughness checks they are required to take. Hits from weapons um, with gas or toxin must reroll the dice to see if they inflict an injury should they successfully equal or beat the target's toughness. Not as good as the Vatborn upgrade. Just it just isn't. The, needing the six is not as good as having to reroll what is a lot of the time a three plus or two plus on the dice. Adaptive Mind for plus 5 credits. Count secondary skill sets as primary skill sets when you're spending XP. That is good because it moves the secondary skill sets, which on some fighters is ferocity. I think that's a really good upgrade for 5 credits. It moves shooting into primary, which can be really good, especially on leader. It does decrease the cool if you go on your leader by having that born in there but your cool is four plus you're hardly ever going to fail that five plus by having that minus one i think that's worth it there if you were going shooting on your leader especially alpha's lineage counts a leadership skill set as one of their primary skill sets potentially good but your leader's already got it and that's usually all you need in a gang in addition, you have group activation X. You can activate one more fighter than normal when using it. If it does not have it, they gain group activation one. I would say good on it can potentially be good on gangers, but I don't think it's the greatest in the world. Having a, I don't think it's worth the trade-off of going that barn on your champions to get to two on a group activation. I think your action economy is already so heavily in the favour of the enemy gang by you being expensive that you're not going to get good usage out of this. It's going to encourage you to do bad things. Iron Flesh, 10 credits. Increase the fighter's wound characteristic by one. Really good for 10 credits. That's a, that's a skill upgrade. That's the most expensive skill or XP-based upgrade that there is in the XP game, and it's only 10 credits. Definitely worth it on your leader, of which you can have two upgrades from the Gene Smith in. It's definitely, definitely worth it. Over engineered, minus 10 credits. When this fighter must roll on last an injury, roll twice and accept the worst result. Minus 10 credits, not worth it at all. Rolling twice. Rolling once on last injuries is bad enough. Rolling twice is going to deny you that out cold so many times. It's going to get you. It's going to immediately start getting you those lasting damages, and I would not take it ever. Prime specimen improve one of their characteristics by one for ten credits. Oh, a four wound leader that can go to six by being that born. Incredibly, incredibly powerful. Don't abuse it, please. Rapid Muscle Growth for plus 5 credits. The fighter can increase their strength characteristic by up to 3 rather than the usual 2. I don't think he's worth it. Spend the credits on your weapons rather than on this to gain Rapid Muscle Growth. 
these better places. For five credits more, you can just go prime specimen, increase your strength by one, and you have spent five, you get immediately that strength upgrade, as well as your ongoing strength upgrade will increase by two, making a total of plus three strength, which is comparable to this. Just not worth it over prime specimen. Redundant organs plus 15 credits, the opposite of over-engineered, so roll twice, choose the lower result on your um, last injuries table. Incredibly worth it, incredibly worth it. Spoilt for choice with iron flesh, prime specimen and redundant organs. Just so incredibly good. That is good on, fight on leaders, champions, stimmers. I wouldn't put it on your gangers, it's just too expensive to let them die. Whatever, they're just gangers. But it's really good on all the people that you need to stay around. Tyrant's own, plus 20 credits. The fighter can improve any two of their characteristics by one. Only the leader can may take this. Definitely, definitely worth it for 20 credits. Toughness and wounds fall within characteristics. Tyrant's Pride, minus 20 credits. Only the Tyrant can take this. However, you cannot choose any fighters with Gang Hierarchy Champion. Potentially, potentially good for the fluff, but Stimmers also include Champion, so you're gonna have no Nerves of Steel access, and is the hardest skip in this entire, entire section. Just don't do it. So unborn upgrades, we come to possibly the funnest section of the gene smithing. And we have, so it's already 10 credits to upgrade them to unborn to get that primary skill in something else. It, that was worth it, I, I said on, on a lot of people. It does take you up into that high range of credits cost, but sometimes that's worth it. And getting into the upgrades, you get data slug overlay, minus 10 credits. Something's gone wrong with the data slug as they hammered it into the person's brain. This fighter activates the first time in the battle, take an intelligence check, which is bad for you Goliaths. If it's failed, it becomes subject to insane. So punishing and only minus 10 credits. If you want to win games, don't do it. Doc's experiment, plus five credits. Select two characteristics, movement, strength, toughness, or wounds. Increase one characteristic by one, decrease the other by one. Potentially, <sighs> champions always need extra movement. If you, if you want to really whack it, go, you go prime specimen, and especially on your leader, tyrant zone, to increase by three, two characteristics by one, and one by one. This, you can get your movement higher, which is good. You can mitigate minuses to strength by taking off by taking good weapons. Toughness and wounds do not decrease that, and mo movement don't decrease it. The only one really that you could ever decrease here is strength, if you want to win any sort of games. Doc's failure minus ten credits decreased two of the movement, strength, toughness, or wounds by one. So this is getting back down to your basic human stat line. So you can actually take this and you're just a basic grunt, average human walking about that's not been properly inducted into the Goliaths. It could be quite fluffy. It's, it's not going to be great though, because you've already, I suppose you could take your primary shooting, decrease your strength toughness by one on your champion and have a properly basic human average stat line for your unborn out of the house fighter genetic outsider you can't use group activation only a tyrant forge boss can take this i wouldn't do it just in those clutch, clutch situations you want to that one turn group activate i know you want to be wasting other people's activations most of the time but there will just be that one time where you want to group activate. I wouldn't I wouldn't sacrifice five credit that for five credits here. Malformed. Your fighter increases their strength characteristic by one but reduces initiative by one. 
really good for five credits really good strength strength five it's, it's, it's only five credits you see that's these different things come into play when the credits values change as we all know what's worth it and what's not and i think it's worth it here proto goliath minus 10 has yet to undergo the transformative surgery increase movement by one reduce strength by one reduce toughness by one reduce cool by two intelligence by two increase will power by one so here is what i was saying about doc's failure it's like that was the halfway house this is the full hog is it gets you back down to that primary it takes off the cost of that primary skill set being a primary skill set do i think it's worth it it takes away your thing for the gang it's good for the fluff reasons it's fun for the fluff reasons having normal people walking about in goliath gang sometimes it's not game winningly good scar tissue plus 10 credits Reduce all damage of all hits suffered by one to a minimum of one. So it's like halfway house to um, true grit, but just bought instead of earned, got by skills or XP upgrades. I think it's worth it on certain uh, champions and leaders. Do I think it's better than the other options of dermal hardening and stuff in the vat barn stuff in the stuff in the nap barn with over engine oh sorry with a prime specimen and tyrant zone no but it's if you want that person with shooting primary you've only got this list to choose off potentially yes survivor plus 10 credits seen a hard life when making recovery tests re-roll one dice of the injury dice rolled not worth that 10 credits i don't think but it tells all of these tell a story of life before Goliath, and I think this does it really well. Stim implants plus five credits feed a steady stream of chems into the blood. When you activate, you can choose to increase strength by two till the end of the round. On roll the d6 in the end phase on a four plus, suffer a flesh wound. I don't think there's ever a time where you massively need pluses to strength, but it's fun. It's, it's got that random chance. You punch people to death on a 2 plus, which is fun, but I just don't think you need it that much. And you, if you go in, if you whack in it and you go in unborn, you're not going to be wanting to prioritize punching people in combat. Just do it with another champion with a renderizer. And two lives, five credits. Your Goliath's mind is split in half. Whenever a fighter gains a skill as an advancement, um, or for free during creation, randomly generate a second skill from their primary or secondary skill sets. Make a note on the skill sets as a pair. Whenever selected to take part in a battle, one of these skills is determined at random will be forgotten. Roll a d6 basically to determine which 50-50 chance which will be forgotten. What I would do is have them in columns and randomly generate which column comes to the fore. And... I think it's really fun, your Goliath's mind's getting split in half. This is the main fun of this unborn list. And I think it's such a good it's such a good fluff thing that I think everyone should have one, right? Everyone should have one. So that is the end of the gene smithing section. So finally, we're at the section where I recommend gangs and we will get into that now as I pull out my phone. So onto the list and it's actually worth saying before that, I think actually one really fun way, I can't really do it in this video because it would be weird just filming me for 15 minutes rolling dice. Um, but I think randomizing what gene smithing upgrades you got even if you gave weight to certain ones or say nat born fighters were more likely for your forge uh, tyrant maybe for your forge bosses um, having vat born fighters more weighted to gangers unborn fighters more weighted to gangers and prospects something like that is i think that would be a really fun way to do gene smithing 
rather than just picking what is absolutely best. Also then when you're within that for the actual genesmithing upgrades, randomizing, even giving weight to certain upgrades like Tyrant's own or Prime Specimen, even, the, even if you weighted the better ones, randomizing it would be a really cool way of creating your gang. And if anyone's done that, let me let me know tell me and tell me how it's gone for you how did it play out in the story of your gang so onto the list and i've done two one which is gene smithing is too much trouble and that is a forge tyrant who is vat born with no upgrades double combi plasma stub with furnace plates they would have iron will forge boss with nerves of steel, renderizer, furnace plates, armored undersuit, stim slug stash, another forge boss, and this is what I tend to run in my gang for a thousand credits. Another forge boss, stub gun with dundum to make it a shooting strength four, so he's otherwise punching with your fists would be better. It just wouldn't give you that extra attack. So it's stub gun dundum, power axe, furnace plates, armored undersuit, stim slug stash. A forge barn with heavy rock saw and furnace plates. A bruiser with a stub cannon and smoke grenades. A bully with stub gun, brute cleaver and smoke grenades. And a bully with stub gun and brute cleaver. And that will, you'll be able to throw your smoke for cover. You've got protection on your combat characters that are the champions so that you're not massively taking risks with your leader. Your leader's a bit more protected with the stub plasmas. And I think it works well for me, it's quite fun. The only thing that's missing there is the sump croc start. And you could do that by just playing around with the undersuits, maybe taking off some stim slug stashes, changing out brute cleavers to just axes or mauls on the bullies. Um, and I think all those are decent options. Now, next one, which is a bit more war crimey. And that is a Forge Tyrant who is Nat Thorn. So it will be less cool, more intelligent, more willpower. With Prime Specimen and Tyrant's own. So you can buff two stats. And you can, you can buff three times in total. Two different stats from the Tyrant's own. One for Prime Specimen. I'll leave it up to you which one you buff. You can check out the gene smithing bit of this section if you skip straight here. Stub gun with dum dum for the same reason as in the last list. Renderizer serrated axe. Now that's in there because he wants to be the biggest killiest thing around and prove it as a forge tyrant. The dum dum is to knock people off as I said. Actually it wasn't in the last section it was in the, the forge tyrant bit. You want to be able to knock people off ledges with your gun and the dum dum is there based on where I punch at strength four, so I want the strength four. You've then got a stimmer who is vat born with dermal hardening for more war crimes, furnace plate, stim slug stash, and paired mastercrafted pulverizers, as is gentleman choice. Forge boss, nap born with redundant organs, so you're rolling twice on lasting injuries and picking the best result for you. Renderizer serrated axe, furnace plates, Arm and undersuit, stim slug stash, because again, that is just gonna prove that you're the hardest combat character around. You've then got a bruiser who is stub gun, stub cannon, smoke grenades. The stub gun in there was just to fill points. I don't think it's the, the greatest upgrade. You can play around with Gene Smith in a little bit as we went through in that section, but it was just easy to throw in and I don't care too much if it's a bruiser. Then it's two bullies. One with stub gun, brute cleaver, smoke grenades, furnace plates, and a second bull the second bully is exactly the same. So you've got quite a lot of smoke in that list, and you've got three champions who are going to absolutely carry your gang to victory. And that is really, really war crimey. And as I feel dirty just saying it, because that is enough horrible stuff in that list to make anyone cry. And that, for everyone at home, and me here, is the House of Chains done. Now, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, all of that good stuff. And that will show me you like this sort of content so I know to produce more. 
If you really liked it, there is a Patreon link below and going to be flashing up on screen with the end credits. Uh, and that will have a link to the Patreon, obviously, where you can get yourself a bouncy tray, as well as to join the discussion in the Discord, which you'll gain access to on the Patreon. And if you just want to acquire some models and you're in the UK, there is a link to the War Office that's an affiliate link that I get a slight cut of uh, for recommending them. And they do 25% off to all Games Workshop products and 30% if it's a new release and that is it from me so i will catch everyone next time in a bit dum, dum.